here we go. Since colored glass was first discovered a trillion years ago, people have been trying to melt it together. They've tried, and they've failed. Even Picasso wanted to make his paintings out of glass. Why? Because painters love light, duh. And glass harnesses light like no other artistic medium. The problem is that glass has very delicate chemical properties that throughout history have made this melting process very unreliable. That is until the 1970s, when a group of hippie glass blowers in Portland, Oregon, created the Bullseye Glass Company. They figured out how to make a wide variety of colored glasses that could be heated and cooled successfully in a kiln. It's called fusing. I discovered Bullseye Glass during the making of the resurrection window which was the subject of the documentary, Holy Frit. This material sparked a movement that has allowed me and many other artists to build careers out of using bullseye glass. Needless to say, I owe a lot to those hippies. So Justin and I and the Vitrionics crew went up to Portland to learn how bullseye and fused glass came to be and came to change the world of glass art forever. How are my eyebrows, Justin? Are they okay? They're good. So since we're here to talk about Bullseye, I saw something pretty telling and funny yesterday on Wikipedia. Here's the history of Bullseye Glass. Bullseye Glass Company was founded in 1974 by Dan Schwer, Boyce Lundstrom, and Ray Algren. In early 2016, what? 2016? 42 years missing? High levels of the toxic heavy metals, cadmium, arsenic, and chromium were discovered in the vicinity of the company's plant in East Portland. So that's where we're going with this. Well, suffice it to say, there's more to the story than that. So that's what we're doing here. We're going to tell the story and uh, let's fire away. In the 60s, you, you literally had nothing to lose. I mean, it well, was just... You're, you're high on coke the whole time. <laughs> that was later when we started making money. Oh, yeah. <laughs> no, but what you were high on was this concept that you didn't have to do what your parents did. You didn't have to, you know, if you didn't want to go into the military, you didn't have to. That you could do what you wanted to do. Uh, so you were really free, right? And Ray and I were uh, classmates back at the University of Wisconsin glass program with Harvey Littleton. So that was in 62, 63. You, so you discovered glass earlier than Dan did, and, and how yeah, did you I discover went, it? It was just walking into the glass studio one day. It was just instant. That uh, I still love doing clay, but that was it. So University of Wisconsin was a hotbed for... Oh, it was, the, it was where it, was it all beginning. started. Right. It, Harvey Littleton sure. was the chairman of the art department. It was the first studio in the United States in a university. It was in what Madison, Wisconsin. All the programs that exist in the United States in glass came from students who graduated from the University of Wisconsin, Madison. And Harvey Littleton's concept was you can do this in your own studio just like a painter or a printmaker. I got to see some of Harvey Littleton's work and this guy happens to be the father of the studio glass movement. He helped artists bring the art of glass into their own home studios. The studio glass blower was Harvey's 
dream. Dream, right? Yeah, yeah. that would be. And he dream. made it happen. And we—that was our first dream was to follow that dream, and that was our first studio. Yeah. And the people that we think of as the modern glass masters all came out of this place in Madison, Wisconsin. It's just crazy. Ray and Dan were beautiful partners as glass blowers sharing a studio, and they had a combined love of making things work and understanding the material. We were going to continue to be, blow glass because that was really, I think both our passions, it was mine. But inadvertently you've now created an industry that to me at least is way more convenient to the studio artist than glass blowing. Oh, no question about it. No question about it. Yeah. 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 So you guys were blowing glass. So how did you transition from that, or were you at, actually at doing an art fair in Bellevue, Washington? Okay. Where Boyce was, and yeah. Boyce had these funky—they were called steam bubbles, right? So he was selling out. He sold thousands of dollars oh worth God. of those things, uh -huh. and we had these elegant vases and goblets and sure. cups, and didn't sell a fucking thing, right? <laughs> so that's where Boyce then convinced us to start a company oh. uh, to make sheet glass. We couldn't make a living in the, the early 70s trying to blow glass, late 60s, early 70s. People weren't collecting it, there weren't galleries showing it. We'd go to art fairs and we'd see these stained glass people and they were all complaining that they couldn't get any stained glass. So we said, hey, here's an opportunity. Start a business, make stained glass, uh, the sheet glass, the raw material, so the idea was to start this business, each make $100,000, we even quantified it, and go on with our career as glassblowers. Had we, I think, gone and looked at what's involved in making sheet glass, we would have been overwhelmed and would have never done it. In the height of the renaissance of stained glass in the early 60s and mid 70s, these three guys were kind of hippies. A talented group of craftsmen in Portland, Oregon recently built a unique sort of factory. A refactory that makes stained glass from recycled bottles. I started the company with Ray Algren and Boyce Lindstrom in 1974 in a little backyard of a small house on Bush Street. The group was determined to substitute ingenuity for money whenever possible. We had no vehicle. Yeah. And, and Boyce bought a brand new Mazda van out of truck. Mazda truck. That pickup was, truck. Yeah. A pickup truck. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. As a bribe. As and a it worked. Bribe. It worked. We were, yeah. Okay, yeah, we'll do it. You know, the know-it-all attitude of a glass blower, I'm great. I, I can blow glass. I can do anything. So we were arrogant enough to think that we, we could do it, right? And we started out by rolling a sheet of glass. We didn't even have an oven to put it in, right? So we're throwing it back and forth with asbestos gloves on, wondering, you know, what do you do with it now, right? So when I look, because somewhere I still have a copy of a studio ceramic magazine where you did an article for Copper, copper Ruby. Copper Red, because copper the Ruby's. first glass we made was a Copper Red, Cat's Paw Red. Okay. It's all we made for like six months. Ray had experience in glaze formulation, so he naturally fit into glass composition, and Boyce was a salesman, to say the least. With your work, what you guys were doing, you guys were artists, and he was a salesman, right? I mean, he was like a, a dreamer, and he was, you needed him, and he needed you. your definition of artist, in yeah, a way, yeah. he was one of the most creative people oh, yeah? Yeah. I knew. And to this day, he had more ideas than you knew what to do with. Yeah. Oh, David wow. entering the scene is really funny because the first time he came, Boyce basically threw him out. Basically, said, yeah. I came in here, I said, my God, this is like Frankenstein's best workshop. I went, sparks are flying, dogs are barking. Everybody's uptight, pissed off. How did I find this place? Boyce comes rolling out and he looks at me and he says, you know, reaches into this barrel of scrap and he says, well, if you make something out of it, come back anytime. Otherwise, call first. So I go home that night, you know, and I'm just like, oh my God, I met these freaking geniuses, you know, so I'm down here doing this. 
putting that together, and so I showed up the next day, and then you showed Boyce. Oh yeah, yeah. yeah. But then that from there, then you didn't what, throw him out. Didn't yeah. throw me out. That, then it was work. You could work for glass. That was it. Ah. I kind of think if Boyce Lundstrom was alive, that he and I would get along well. Oh, I think he'd hit it off amazingly well. Yeah. What was he like? Larger than life. Hmm. Was he especially, a genius? especially in his own mind? A genius in his own he, mind. I mean, did he have great ideas? Boyce was messianic about anything he was doing. And that's, that's just a personality. It's a personality that it's fabulously powerful at the beginning of a company, not so much beneficial to its continuation. Wow. Boyce Lundstrom was obsessed and he started bugging me because I was a foremost stained glass artist, maverick, doing a experimental work in stained glass. And he wanted me to see that Bullseye could do this. Well, I went up to Bullseye in 1976, I think, uh, 77, somewhere in there. And I didn't like at all what they were doing. But he kept on, on my case, even after that trip. Over time, we realized that yes, there was really a need for this glass. And more importantly, there was a real interest in glass that didn't look like what the other three manufacturers were making. So we were making really funky glass. So the aha moment was, oh, the funky glass is actually more interesting than trying to make it look perfect, mm. right? And it really opened up that opportunity of being a, a specialty glass maker. We have a set of samples that we match. In order to match those samples, the glasses are so sensitive that as furnaces change, as sources of raw materials change, and many other changes that take place, the, the thickness of the sheet, the way it's being annealed, there's actually a fair amount of experimentation required to do something exactly the same. This is like a little bit of foreshadowing because, you know, at this point, they're trying to make something that they can repeat. And this is not even him talking about fusing. You know, like anything that, that you're crafting and creating, it's not just a push of a button. It's manpower, it's ingenuity, and it's time, and it's um, dedication from day one. Cubist, Brock. Picasso, they played around with, with melting glass into images. It didn't work, it broke. You know, they used different glues and they put stuff in the oven. And, uh, but they were fascinated by it because artists forever, painters especially, have wanted light inside their work. But I think there's an inherent people, anybody that works for glass wants to melt it together. Yeah. It's just like you said, Picasso wanted to use yeah. glass, they wanted to melt it together. Everybody wants to melt it together and make one piece. Yeah, well it started out, quite frankly, because we were making colored glasses and mixing them together and we'd find that occasionally they would break at the interface so that they weren't compatible so that got us onto that thing how do you make the glasses compatible a few years later we met this man Klaus Moyer <laughs> Klaus was doing incredible work in this process and losing most of what he made because of incompatible glass, right? Klaus's early work was beautiful, but it was very, very limited. This was one of the very first uh, experimental pieces. I think it was the second or third piece uh, that I made in mosaic glass. And okay, what Klaus was doing was melting rods um, from color bars, which are made for the bead and button industry. He was melting them together, and sometimes they worked, and sometimes right. they didn't. Okay. And it typically, when it didn't, it was during the, the cold working process. It was, that's when the incompatibilities okay. would show up. They had to solve an enormous amount of technical problems, because you can mix the colors when they're hot, but when they cool, you know, the red might expand, the blue might contract, and they crack. So it wasn't until we had a problem to solve, and I think that's what drives us almost always to, to be a maverick or to do something that we wouldn't normally do because there's a problem. How do you solve this problem? Uh, and that was this idea of compatibility. Uh, the first time when, when, when I met Boyce, 
1979, he invited me to come down uh, to Bullseye. And I got the promise that we make uh, you a palette of color that you really can work with. We see your problems with your, with your incompatible glass that you use, and uh, we will do it. <laughs> and uh, I said, okay, you guys, uh, I don't tell anyone. Voice would be running around trying to sell the stuff we hadn't made yet, right? Right, totally. <laughs> Making totally. promises that you guys couldn't keep? Yeah. Voice said, all our glass fits. Of course it didn't, but it was close. Hey, what did he say? What the hell did he say? Sorry, go back. Boyce said, all our glass fits. Of course it didn't, but it was close. I have to say, honestly, the more I learn about Boyce, the more I think I'm very much like him. He's promising people things that he can't do. Well, okay, I'm like him in the fact that the things that he promises eventually get done. I told Church of the Resurrection I could do this window. And it's not because I knew at the time how to do it, but it's because I knew at the time that I was going to figure out how to do it. You know, he would say stuff that might not be true, but he would trust that they could make it true. And he had Ray and he had Dan. And I think, you know, he trusted them to figure it out. And that's the beauty of that relationship. I think they, all three of them were very compatible. <laughs> There was a new phase where they decided that they could probably invent glasses that could merge together and when cooled stay together. Because when you think of stained glass, traditional stained glass, you have different colors, each one bound by lead, and the colors have to be kept separate. So they had this vision, put all the colors into one sheet. The sort of aha moment in that was that it wasn't the coefficient of expansion, that it was really the viscosity of the, of the glasses and that in order for them to not get stress as they cooled, that they had to have very similar viscosities through their transition range was the most important thing. So that's when we really understood how to make compatible glass. That is the single biggest contribution that Bullseye has made to the history of glass, right there. It's significant. It's a huge, huge difference in terms of what glass has been able to do for thousands of years. Two years later, really, was the first box of Bullseye glass on my doorsteps. I know, I remember this day when I came home in Hamburg and, and there was this box of glass. From there I started new, I would say, in a successful way to handle this material. Really then continued so that I never again used my, my canes. I still have five tons hanging around. Five, five tons of cane? <laughs> well, we did the first case of glass for Klaus Moyer, I believe in 1980, I think. But we were, we were actually losing money on fusing. As a matter of fact, at one point I got into some real arguments with Boyce about, hey, you know, uh, we're not making anything on the fusing and that's where we're putting all of our, our energy. When Bullseye um, started making fusible glass, it almost bankrupted them. But uh, we ended up getting the Xerox contract. I mean, it's a piece of glass, I see that. It's a piece of turquoise glass, but there's more to it than just a scrap that I can yep. use in my sliders? Yep. Tell yep. me. Don't you dare. Oh, really? This kept Bullseye alive for probably five years, the very beginning. An engineer from Xerox back in the early 80s walked into a stained glass shop where his wife was taking a class and said, look at that color, you know, that looks like the filters we're buying from Germany, and tracked Bullseye down. And he said, I'm looking at your 116 and I'm wondering if you've got, if you can make it so it transmits higher in the ultraviolet and less in the infrared. And I just went, uh-huh. I mean, we, it was way over our head to do what they were asking us to do, but we just said, oh yeah, of course we can do that. Right? Wow, I had no idea. And for five years, we got about 100 times the price per pound for this glass that we got for all of the art glass. And it helped to, frankly, subsidize um, kiln forming, for which there was no market at all. So fusible glass owes a lot to Xerox. I mean, Really? If it wasn't for Xerox, I 
would probably still be working as a stained glass artist. Wow. We really worked together well while we were striving, but then once we did have income and we were looking successful, then you start looking around and going, well, is Boyce really doing his job or is he just right. going out and having a good time? And, you know, Ray, are you, you know, leaving at noon and not coming back until the next day? And Dan, you know, what are you doing, right? Yeah. So we knew at some point we would have to set part ways yeah. uh, and that we'd have to each go our individual way. But, you know, having to break up the three of us was was disheartening. You know, Ray and I were really close all those years. It was interesting how then Ray was able to go on to work at Spectrum and, and Boyce went on to start Oceanside Tile and, and other things. So I stayed here still trying to make that first $100,000. Right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's crazy. Something happened between figuring out fusing, the fusing ranch, Xerox, a little bit of financial success, and then everything kind of split apart. But, you know, those three guys are, will always be tied in history. So, but it's interesting, here we are in the early 80s and things are falling apart and Dan is holding the ship together without his partners. And I wonder who comes in to help him keep the ship afloat. It. If you don't leave your fingerprints on it. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Eventually, I get to be about 29 years old, and I'm realizing that my education in liberal arts, literature, languages, is qualifying me to be a waitress for the rest of my life. And uh, somehow, I fell into glass. I was living in New Mexico. Found out about a conference in San Diego. It was called PortCon. Went there, ran into some crazy guys from Portland, Oregon. David had taped a note to Boyce's, I think he was wearing an Aloha shirt or something, and he was sort of lying there, semi-conscious on the beach, and it said, David, dress me and take me to the party. And that was my first my first interaction. Make a note of that, Justin. We're going to do that. My, do my that. first Tonight interaction with the bullseye guys. They were all about fusing and nobody else was. Nobody knew what right. it was. Nobody. Okay. And then I, he said, come on up and you want to see the factory. So I came up here and uh, whoa, what a weird place. I sound like such a sucker. I gave him everything I had. So you said, so you invested your savings in Bullseye mm -hmm. and because you believed in him and you believed in what they were doing. I was thrilled with, I mean, I was, yeah. I was mesmerized by, it was like steroids of what I'd been doing. <laughs> Miss McGregor, Lonnie McGregor, the love of my life, mm. a person, a magnitude smarter than me, which I love. She really thrust us into the hardcore art part of our business. Yeah. What's really important is that this work is shown. From that we learned, hey, go out, teach classes. Lonnie and I went through Europe, taught in five different countries in the early 80s. Just tried to get as many people as we could exposed to the process, especially we went to colleges and universities from the Royal College to Swansea. So Lonnie is really the spirit of this company, especially as it moves forward. 
Well, that picture, the, the pictures that I saw of that factory with all these little houses and this roof over the top of them, man, what a talk about yeah. patchwork. Yeah, we, we realized at that point we needed to look corporate. So we got a, an architectural firm and they designed um, a gorgeous building that they just built right over the top of all those funky little houses. And then they brought in a, a demolition crew, a team of guys who were just, God, they, they, they were acrobatic. They just pulled those houses out and threw them out the window. And, uh, and from the outside, we looked like we were corporate. But it was not until 1993 when we decided to do something a little more formal and actually invite a whole mob of artists in in the same year. Narcissus was going to be our, our stained, stained glass, glass right. artist. He would not behave. He would not do stained glass. Yeah. I went up there very skeptical, but their idea of fusing glass and make all colors fusible was a very compelling idea. And when I finally went and experienced it, I realized that a whole new world was possible. Glass is fire, so it moves. A line can be soft and melt into the piece. Dots can be soft and melt or can be hard. Millions of little effects can be reached when the glass is molten. And that's what's so exciting about it. So this is Narcissus Qualiata, who's my mentor in glass. Um, and he, to me, is the greatest living glass artist. And I love him. This, this making all these glasses compatible and fusing them together in all of these different hundreds of ways is a totally new horizon in the making of glass. You know, totally new horizon because all of a sudden you can bring everything that is painting into glass, make it work and add light. My stay there was revolutionary for them, revolutionary for me. For me, it was revolutionary because all of a sudden I had all the means of doing a painting in a single sheet of glass. Revolutionary for them because I made them see stuff that you could do with their material that they had no clue that what, they could do this. The very vitrograph was invented there so that lines could be made uh, with all kinds of configurations. So a lot of the things that Narcissus pushed back there 20 years ago are now commonly used, but people don't know where they came from. But they came from his demanding. In fusing, you can put 50 colors in an area like this. It's a totally different process. Fusing is bonding pieces of glass together with heat and gravity. Well, when we first introduced the, the process of kiln forming to the marketplace. For the record, we've heard the terms here fusing and kiln forming, and Klaus uses the term glass mosaic. Um, they all mean the same thing. They mean using a kiln to melt different pieces of glass together. Well, when we first introduced the, the process of kiln forming to the marketplace, it wasn't received well. It was, we were looked at as a bunch of hippies that are, had gone off the track. We would go to the trade shows like SGAA, yeah. oh. right? And we were the laughing stock of it. They literally laughed at us, all those studio owners. They just said, you guys are just so full of shit. That's what I thought. I never thought of fusing as a grand, beautiful, viable, fine art form. That's what was so eye-opening to me about Bullseye was, oh, you can do this with fusing? When Bullseye started getting into compatible glass, the distribution network was somewhat resistant. 
We just kind of said, you know what, that the stained glass market hasn't figured it out and they probably won't. As far as stained glass studios in the United States or e even in the world, traditionally we haven't been that involved with, with them. Nobody knows what this is and the place to, at least in those days, in the 80s and 90s, the place to make that message loud and clear was in art fairs. San Francisco, Miami, Chicago, New York, then we went to London. The ANU program, the results uh, speak for themselves. And we got this idea of having a research and education department. We would go to shows and people would be telling us what they were doing with this new material. And I'd realize, Jesus, they're doing stuff with this glass that we don't know how to do that. We've never done this stuff. So maybe we need a department where we try to do this stuff before the customers do this stuff. So then we developed the first research and development, which then became research and education. Oh, I give you, you the great Ted Sawyer, everybody. Hi, Ted. How's it going? Great. How are you? Is this a pretty typical ride for you on a daily basis? Uh, I mean, <laughs> this is me. This is it? This is my route. Okay. We're both scientists. We are both yeah. scientists. Uh, we are. I mean, as an artist, yeah. don't you consider yourself to be somewhat of a scientist? Absolutely not. Okay, so this is really interesting because to me, the scientific method is so similar to the artistic method, at least as I practice it. It's one thing to teach people how to do stained glass. It's another thing altogether to teach people how to do kiln glass. Um, people forget that you know, from the time they're very young, they learn how to use something like this, you know, a pen or a pencil. But when you get into something like glass, you don't have any background. So you have to have an education program. I think they just want, they want to be the sort of support system behind all of the crazy artists like me that are using the material. We're crazy. I mean, it's capital intensive, it's energy intensive, it's labor intensive. It's not something that most people understand how to use, what it is, what it can do. It's not low-hanging fruit. Um, so, in case you're wondering why Ted looks different in every scene, it's because we've been filming him for a long time. Uh, this is Ted in his Big Lebowski look, which was probably from, I don't know, 2019 or so, maybe 2017. And the reason we've been filming him is because we made this huge window in Kansas. Ted helped us out. And along the way, we filmed the whole process and a documentary was created about that window called Holy Frit, which you might have seen. Um, but Ted is a very prominent figure in that film. And uh, he's been a very prominent figure in the life of most fused glass artists. It's not low hanging fruit, but the fruit that you can grow from it is pretty amazing. Oh God, hustle, hustle, Out there physically doing it, you'll watching the casters make the glass. There's definitely an art, there's a dance, there's a community, a choreography that goes on. There is beauty, there is art in the process, but there's also it's very science-based for sure. And Sam's the Sam's the brilliant uh, well, gonna, chemist now. Really Sam is beautiful. You say cobalt, and he says, ah, it means goblin in German. Sam. Sam, Sam, incredibly so. He, in my mind, is a wizard. I mean, he's doing what I started doing, but he's at a level that I can't even okay. imagine. Sam, how long have you been here? 8-8 eight, eight of 88. Hold on, do the math for me. Um, it's it's uh, life without parole. <laughs> Sam. Morning. You're kind of a legend here. What do you, uh, what do you think about that? I really don't. 
I tend to be much more in the here and now and concerned with what I need to accomplish today. Okay, here's a question. What is glass? Uh, yeah, that's, that's a pretty broad question. <laughs> My understanding is really glass making, like many things, probably was a fortuitous accident yeah. um, in terms of doing it intentionally. And it's just like many things, somebody paying attention to an accident. You know, we've got cameras rolling here. We're telling the bullseye story. Can you just tell us exactly how to make the glass so that the secret's out? Sure, you take silica sand and lime and soda ash and you put secret sauce in it, right? And I can give you the secret sauce recipe anytime you need it. Fantastic. I mean, I think that's what people think. People think that you guys have a secret sauce, yeah. but I don't, I don't think you do. I think you have, you just know how to work the dials. That's what I think it is. It just takes daily attention to detail and you have to constantly be measuring it and okay. monitoring it. And that's just time consuming and costly. So this was actually something that I thought I understood about fusing that I didn't understand until I went there. Um, there is not actually a thing. It's, it's a bunch of things. And it's a bunch of variables that really can't be quantified. And so what they do, which is remarkable, unlike anybody else, is they do monitor all of these variables and they test, 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 test all their glass to make sure that it's going to work. And if it's not going to work, then they redo it. That was what they discovered was testing and determining compatibility in a predictable way. And still to this day, I don't know of another glass company that, first of all, that's ever published how they test for compatibility. Once they created this testing compatible method, then it became something that any artist could commit a major project to the material because they knew it wasn't gonna change um, and that it was gonna be reliable. And Bullseye put their stamp of approval on every single sheet of glass that they made and they still do that. And I think this is why, you know, Dan coming off a farm, you get up every morning and you melt the cows. Yeah. That's Dan's strength is really about staying power. Like work ethic. Yeah. Most of the equipment here is hand built by Dan. The fact that Dan has been here all this time and he's still so tied in with everything that you guys are doing, that's gotta be kind of amazing, right? Dan is one of the best resources here, and he will help any department at any time. What I learned from Harvey Littleton was you need to build a community. Right. You need, it can't just be you, right? Yeah. At Bullseye, if you're the right personality and you see that something needs to be done, you're allowed to just jump in and start doing it, and sometimes that creates a whole new position. There's sort of this experience of we're teaching people who are using our product, and they're all learning, and then all the employees are learning. It, I love being in an environment where people are excited and they're all learning. I guess I, what I have always, always loved is the full circle, from going to the warehouse and seeing how the glass is made, all the way to selling it, all the way into a finished product. Yeah. That is super rewarding. They all are a little on the artist side. Are you an artist? Are you an artist? Yeah. Do you ever work with the glass? Almost everybody here uses the product themselves. Yeah. God, I love glass blowing. That, that mysterious inter space where the material is still molten and flexible. It's just something that brings you back. For me, it's mostly uh, glass rings. Oh. I'm creating a new style. Uh, we do glass portraits with every student in the school. I found doing this job has gotten so much more talented as an artist. The opportunity to work with the end products and uh, we get a gnarly discount as well. <laughs> and the fact that there's still really cool people around to share that with. How many years have you been here total now? Uh, 31. 30 years ago. Since 1995. August of 1997. I've been here for 23 years. 20 years. 19 years, 18 years, for a dozen years. Going on eight years, seven years, six years, six years, for six years. Six years now. I, it's honestly my dream job. This company is not me. This company is all the people that you all saw today.
Well, it was loud, it was tense, and at times very emotional. It's new information tonight about that scare in the air over southeast Portland. Tonight, the governor issued a cease and desist order against Bullseye Glass after air quality monitoring found dangerously high levels of lead at a daycare that's just down the street from the plant. Okay, so if you can just briefly walk me through what the hell happened and kind of bring me up to where we are in the process now. February 1st of 2016, uh, we were visited by the DEQ. They had previously put an air monitor across the street from us. We never heard anything from them, and then all of a sudden they rush in one day around 3 o'clock. They said, this has been leaked to the press, and it's going to be very bad for you. Brace for it. It was an unbelievable shock, and, you know, the first thing was, did we really do any harm? I mean, was, you know, what, what is this? No, nothing had been fact-checked. We didn't know what was going on. We had never even heard of these air quality benchmarks and come to find out Oregon doesn't have any air quality standards. And they said, well, it's not a regulation, it's just a goal. Um, it's an air quality goal for Portland. We immediately um, ceased production of glasses using cadmium and arsenic. So that was about 50% of our line. Honestly, at the time, we probably should have laid off some people, but um, Dan and Lonnie didn't want to do that, and so we're overproducing in, in colors that we don't need. Yeah, well, we became the poster child for, for pollution in Portland, uh, and it was the farthest thing from the truth. The ones who were most disturbed and worried were, were young mothers, and they had a right to be concerned. The, the press was terrifying them. The company has been linked to potentially dangerous levels of arsenic and cadmium in the air near several schools. I'm sick, you're sick, we're all sick from arsenic. Please get filters. Bullseye has since stopped using cadmium, arsenic, and chromium in production. Many neighbors say that's not enough. All I've done is write letters every night. You will lose money, maybe, but you know what? You're going to lose so much more if you don't listen to the community. That's kind of something that has to be pointed out about the, the air scare thing is that it's pretty absurd what they had to deal with. They were doing nothing wrong. They were poisoning nobody. The, the regulations that had been set for their area, they were way beneath them. But it doesn't matter. You know, when you're a target, it doesn't matter whether you're doing everything right or not. Crazy. Oh, are we still, is this still, is there still more? It's like this right here. All of that foggy stuff that they want you to think it's toxic chemicals, but it's actually just water vapor. We want to be very careful about how we share information so that it doesn't create alarm if it isn't needed. We're being asked to do some tests that no other colored glass manufacturer has been asked to do in the United States that we know of. It's very political at this point and uh, there was someone on the Oregon uh, Public Broadcasting that said when politics and science collide, uh, science gets run over by truck. It's worth noting that the factory here, it's possible, is not the only source of cadmium and arsenic contamination. This is an industrial area, after all. They're demonizing a $20 million company. There is a $3 billion company south of them that emits 30 times the pollutant. The company also told us today that on the two days that DEQ said had the highest concentrations of those two heavy metals, the plant wasn't even in operation. The environmental consultant said, you may not be able to meet the requirements that are gonna be put upon you, but our employees just stepped up and said, hey, we're gonna get through this, we're gonna make it work. Uh, I'm finding it's a little difficult to talk about. Unfortunately, working with DEQ has not served us or the community well. For 30 years, we've worked with them with the permit. Schwerer testified before Environmental Quality Commissioners last week, pleading for clear standards to follow. Guidelines, he says, lawmakers should have enacted years ago. Rules that would have prevented scenes like this outside his facility.
And we started this company recycling bottle glass. We converted the furnaces to oxygen 20 years ago because we were concerned about greenhouse gases. We're good problem solvers. We actually enjoy solving problems. Uh, and this was just another problem to solve. That's kind of how Bullseye operates. It's like we're presented with a challenge and we become experts at what we have to and then we solve the problems. I mean, in itself, there was many technical issues to deal with and to get this thing to run. And then on top of it, feeling the weight of like the entire glass world on us. It wasn't necessarily if this was going to succeed. It's, it has to succeed. We have to make this work. At Bullseye, they're completing production of their pilot bag house, a filtration system that'll allow them to use certain heavy metals again. The team of guys worked morning to night, round the clock, to put together an air emissions control system that exists nowhere in the world. And now we're doing it. I mean, we're running the cleanest glass facility in, in the world. We are very proud of being able to do that within six months. That is pretty much behind us. And we will eventually clear our name. Air scare, we don't need to talk about the air scare, we know about the air scare. The air was scared. <laughs> but Euroboros is gone, Spectrum is gone, Bullseye is not gone. Why are you guys still here? To put it bluntly, we're still here because we were never in it for the money. To me, I could have not abandoned this company having, at the time, 150 employees, many of whom have been with me for as long as 30 years. So I'm not gonna say, hey guys, it's been fun, but it's over, goodbye, right? I couldn't live my, with myself. So that's why we stayed, or a reason why we stayed, is we didn't care if the end result was we lose everything. We were gonna fight to the end. Like Bullseye has to stick around forever <laughs> so that we can make sure that as, as we keep exposing it to people that we'll always have the material, first of all. Now, you may not want to answer this if you don't want. If you don't what's going to happen? What's going to happen, gonna happen when, when you and Dan when, are when gone? How do we make sure that it sticks around forever? Well, first of all, we have a key team of people who will be taking over. And uh, that core team of people are what Bullseye is. We're convinced that that team of people have the same mission and values and probably 30 years more to live than Dan and I do, right. at least. I was asking her what's gonna happen when, when they're gone. And uh, I mean, having spent the last few days, a couple days with you guys, I think the company's in pretty good hands with you and, and Ted and Mary Kay and Sam, whoever else is at the top. I mean, I don't even know who it is, but. Is there anybody that, that kind of sucks that, that I don't know about that might wreck that narrative? The goal being to keep this thing running forever, uh, making you know, the, the most desired and needed glass in the world. Right? It's one thing to go from being a crazy glass blower to becoming a famous artist like a Chihuly or a, you know, whoever you want to name, but it's another thing to go from being a glass blower to completely changing the whole industry of glass which is what they did. Since I started doing stained glass in 1973, I fell in love with this medium. And I, I understand its role in history. I understand our role in history. I understand that we're making history. I understand that, that as much as I read about people who played a role in glass making history, I realize someday somebody will be reading about us. Um, and that excites me and energizes me. Well, let's let's go look. Let's go let's go wander around and. This is one of the original beams of the house. This is where the glass was made. Okay. This was the building. So this is where the casting table was. There were two little furnaces 
here and there, right? So I built this machine. Holy shit. Every weld bead on here, I did myself. I barely knew how to weld, right? This is the heartbeat of all of it, and these guys make the raw materials in the glass. This is where everything can go wrong. Hey guys, don't screw it up. Seriously. How about that? I'm almost there. I'm almost there. <laughs> well, thank you for opening your home to us. Oh gosh, thanks. We have loved this. This has thank been a cool you. thing. And thank you. Thank yeah. you for telling Bullseye's story. Oh, we're we're uh, honored to do it, and we hope we do a good job with it. I know you. And will. If we don't, then hey, hey, what are you gonna do? Yeah. Goodbye, everybody. Goodbye. Good. Everybody. They just don't quit, do they? And <laughs> cut. Wow. Well, there it is. That's a 42 year gap uh, in the history of Bullseye that hopefully we've filled correctly. Um, now, if somebody could just go to Wikipedia and punch all that in and transcribe it, um, that would make the world a better place. <laughs> thank you, Dan. Thank you, Lonnie. Everybody at Bullseye for letting us in and uh, for letting us tell your story. We love the story. We think it matters. And uh, we are absolutely excited and looking forward to the next 42 years. Um, I am looking forward to the next 42 beers. Love you all. See ya. Justin, pub time. No, no, no drinking beer or smoking dope before 2 p.m. or before all major decisions of the day have been made. <laughs> that was in, that was in your policy manual. Yeah, it was actually in a written policy manual, and OSHA made us take it out. You uh, shouldn't right. <laughs>